In the words of President Lubke, we regard your visit as a sign of growing trust in our people. Both the monarch and her consort had strong family ties with Germany. Elizabeth's great-grandmother, Queen Victoria, married her cousin Albert, who was of German nobility. The young prince had studied at the University of Bonn before moving to Britain. At the turn of the 20th century, the royals were known as the House of Saxe, Coburg, Gotha. But anti-German sentiment in World War I convinced them to adopt the name Windsor, which is still in use today. People forget, perhaps, that the name House of Windsor is a made-up name. It's a brand name. The family decided they had to change their name. We would call it a rebranding exercise. It wasn't called in those days. They searched back in history, Tudor, Stuart, Plantagenet, should we have a double-barreled name? And then apparently, the private secretary of the time looked out of the window, saw the round tower of Windsor Castle, and said, let's call it Windsor. Not a family name, town name. For Prince Philip, the ties were even greater. As a descendant of the House of Glücksburg, his family had strong links to the German establishment. When he married Princess Elizabeth, 1947, none of his sisters could attend the ceremony because they'd all been married to German princes who had been on the Nazi side in the war. This trip, however, was more about looking to the future than dwelling on the past. The visit to West Germany is a mark. The Queen is demonstrating to the world and to the British people and to the West in general that West German Federal Republic is a part of the Western Alliance, that the war has been forgotten insofar as this new Germany is a democratic, humane state. And of course, Germany at that time was very anxious to, as it were, be accepted back into the club of Europe, if you like. And so the Queen's visit, in a sense, did enhance that. How much has been done in the last 20 years, and nowhere more than in Berlin, to renew and repair the contact between our people that go so far back into the past. I believe they are now very strong. For the Germans, there was a fascination with the British royals that extended well beyond compensating for the absence of its own monarchy. The Germans actually loved the grandeur of the British royals. It's interesting, because 1965, here in England, the British press and public were almost beginning to feel that in changing times, the royals looked a little bit out of touch, a little bit, you know, old hat. But in Germany, they just loved that. To have met royalty in the person of such a queen amid such scenes of splendor must now be among their treasured memories. And for the queen herself, what more exciting memory than the great firework display a few days earlier, the night the Rhine caught fire. But it was impossible to ignore the divisive nature of the capital city. At the end of World War II, Germany had been divided into four sectors administered by the main allied partners, the United States, Britain, France, and the Soviet Union. Ideologically, the Soviet Union under Stalin sat poles apart from the three other victors and was far more interested in building up the power of the Eastern Bloc countries than in working with the Western alliance. A steady stream of people deserting East Germany for West Germany in the 1950s prompted the Soviets to build the 156 kilometer wall that would become the most visible part of the so-called Iron Curtain. For the Queen, it was impossible to visit Germany without acknowledging the battles that still lay ahead for some of its people. Nowhere is the tragedy of a divided world made more evident than in this city. She sees the Berlin Wall, which symbolizes the partition of Europe and the forceful constraint of people uh, living within the communist area. She also visits Royal Air Force cemeteries, inspects German troops. This is a formal recognition that Germany has changed. Uh, it has changed politically, but also changed its inner nature. 